Hello there, welcome back to Globalization. This is a recorded revision guide for you to use to aid your revision with globalization. And this is the EQ2 topic of globalization, which is what are the impacts of globalization for countries, different groups of people and cultures and the physical environment. So this doesn't replace what you've done in lesson. This is just a roundup of the key areas you need to be able to discuss and the key points of the entire of EQ2. Please go back and watch EQ1 if you've not already done so, and EQ3 will follow this revision video. So EQ2 starts with the idea of the global shift and also recaps it from EQ1 as well. And the idea here is to look at the winners and losers because of the global shift of manufacturing to Asia. So remember, the global shift is that idea that we have seen outsourcing of shoring to Asia in the last 30 or 40 years. And that has meant that some people have a won from that process and others have lost. So the advantages of the global shift are that waged work is created, particularly in China, India, Bangladesh and so on, where we see higher incomes, stable incomes, more regular and reliable wages and conditions generally have improved for those people. Another advantage is that has led to poverty reduction. So the amount of people that shifted out of poverty since 1990 has been 1 billion and incomes therefore have risen and also prices have risen because of that increase in income. And we also have the idea that the global shift has created new education and training because TNCs have invested in China, India, Bangladesh and so on. And that has created investment in infrastructure and improvement in skills, economic growth. And therefore, that's led to a generation that is better educated, better skilled and has better and higher incomes. However, there are losers out of the global shift idea. And one of the disadvantages of it is that there has been a loss of productive farmland. So because of the construction of factories, new infrastructure, that means there's been a loss of agricultural land and also a rise in air and water pollution as a result. We also have the idea that there have been unplanned settlements popping up in major cities around the world. And this is due to rural urban migration. Lots and lots of people have been moving from rural areas to cities and towns, and that has meant that more people have been moving than houses being built, which creates slums or shanty towns in some mega cities. And finally, we have environmental pressure. I related to this earlier when I talked about farmland. When we have industry, it creates serious water and air issues in some cases, and environmental protections are often not in place to deal with these issues. And therefore, we see a depletion in minerals and resources and air pollution and water pollution at the same time. And just to remember, I mentioned earlier, too, that outsourcing and offshoring are really good examples of what causes these advantages and disadvantages. An example of this is China, and I've mentioned it a couple of times. China has winners and losers as a result of the global shift. So since 1980, really, China has undergone an industrial revolution, a lot like the UK did in the 1700s and 1800s. But we've seen severe air pollution in cities like Beijing, where it's unsustainable. We've seen six million cars and coal burning power stations, which means that we've seen a massive increase in coal burnt, we've seen China's rivers and lakes polluted, we've seen soil erosion, and all of these are environmental issues that have human consequences as well. So the people who live in these places become less healthy and there's more lung issues, breathing issues in general as well. So China is a good example of a place that has winners and losers due to global shift. And of course, the global shift has meant that there's been a shift in manufacturing to the east from the west. And that has meant that there's been decline in industry in the west, like the UK, most of Europe and North America. And that is actually called deindustrialization. So the UK, for example, and the USA are losers in the global shift approach in some ways. And deindustrialization is the closure of manufacturing, like steel, shipbuilding and engineering. 
And really, there are lots of examples of this worldwide. So we've seen declining populations in areas like Detroit in the US. We've seen crime rising in Detroit as well and other areas too. We see dereliction in some cities like Glasgow. And we also see unemployment in the places where manufacturing has fallen. For example, in Hull, which was a large manufacturing area, man, um, unemployment is double the national rate. So it's been at 9% recently. Now, I mentioned rural and urban migration earlier. And let's just explore that a bit more. So the global shift is causing this rural to urban migration trend in LIDC and EDC developing nations. And people in these nations think that moving to the city for these jobs will create a better standard of living for them. However, it's not always the case. Now, the reason that people move to cities from rural areas in these developing nations is very simply for employment opportunities in these large new businesses and transnational companies for higher wages, for the services that they can have access to, like education, healthcare, government agencies, and so on. And also, we've got to remember the infrastructure that exists in these towns and cities. It's usually much better than the rural areas. So we've got good transport links, roads, railway, bus routes, etc. Generally, you've got less um, congestion, especially if you're just outside the city in suburb areas and good connections in terms of broadband, internet. And it usually feels safer for people because there are planned routes and because there are street lights and so on. So these are the pull factors and the reasons why people might move to a city in a developing nation. And this is a direct result of globalization, of course, and the global shift. But there are also push factors that make people want to move away from the rural areas they used to live in. And that is poverty, because we know that in these rural areas, farming is one of the main industries. Conflict as well can be taking place over the scarcity of resources in some rural areas. And there's also the idea of agricultural modernization and the fact that agricultural machinery has meant that there are less people needed and required on farms in rural areas. And that means a loss of jobs, a loss of income, and therefore people are finding alternatives in towns and cities as well. And then we have the idea of international migration. So at the same time as rural urban migration has been taking place, we also see international migrants seeking to move from countries that are less developed or have less opportunities to countries that have more opportunities. So we've seen this in the UK in the 2000s, early 2004 onward, where a lot of Polish people made the move from Poland to the UK. We can also see this even in wealthy people. So Russian oligarchs, something you would have looked at in diverse places. Russian oligarchs have moved into London and bought land and housing in London because of the wealth it holds, because of the assets they can hold as well. So you can see on the right hand side of the screen, there are many benefits and disadvantages or costs to the host country, the place where people move to, and the source country, the place where people move from. So some of those benefits to the country that people move to would include filling skills gaps, increasing cultural and demo demography diversity and population diversity, and also businesses can have the opportunity to have a larger pool of potential employees. Some of the benefits to the source country, the place where people move away from, would include the fact that those migrants who go away abroad to get better jobs often send back what's called remittance which is money they often also become skilled and then move back into the country they came from and bring the new skills they have gained with them but of course also there are costs there are disadvantages to international migration for the country that people move to and they can include the rise of far-right organizations and political parties it can also lead to strains on healthcare and education and house price increases as well. And finally, there can be also costs to the source country, the place where people move away from. 
and they can include things like the brain drain, the idea that skilled people are leaving a nation and going to another nation. Declines in services. Migrants also tend to be young people, so they leave their family behind. It can leave people isolated. So you can see that there are a number of benefits and costs to international migration for both host countries and source countries. And you looked at two examples as case studies for rapid megacity growth, and they were Mumbai and Karachi. So Mumbai is a population of today 22 million, just over 22 million, and it had a population of 10 million in 1970. So rural urban migration here played a major role. Urban employment has widened dramatically. We've seen massive TNCs and big brands like Hilton, hotels and Starbucks widening the middle classes, increasing incomes. But the contrast between the wealthy and the poor has widened massively as well. Poorer areas such as Dharavi, which is a slum with a one million population in the south of Mumbai, is under great pressure. And your other example was Karachi. And this was the former capital of Pakistan and has a population of just over 24 million. It is the center today of finance, industry and trade. And therefore, it provides highly skilled jobs, mainly in shipping, banking, retailing and manufacturing. And it's also a big university city with lots of skilled graduates. And all of this has come about because of globalization and because of the move of people from rural to urban areas. So this city is a massive beneficiary in terms of rural urban migration. And then EQ2 moved into the idea of the impacts of all of this migration on culture and the impacts of globalization on culture. And so you can see what culture involves on the right hand side in the culture wheel. So we have the idea of food and drink, the arts, music, knowledge and stories and traditions and values. So culture is the ideas, customs, social behavior and general feeling of particular people in the society. And then we have three terms to do with culture. So we have the idea of cultural diffusion, which is the spread of cultural beliefs and social activities from one group to another. So this is nationality, nationalities and ethnicities mixing. Cultural erosion, erosion is the reduction in diversity, loss of indigenous cultures, loss of tribes, for example, loss of historical culture as well. And then finally, we have the idea of cultural imperialism. And this is where a very strong nation like the USA can use its culture and promote it over smaller, weaker nations. So this is the idea of hard and soft power. And it's the idea as well that less powerful nations are more prone to having their culture eroded by more powerful, bigger nations. And so we then have the idea of a global culture. Is globalization creating a global culture? Well, there are a number of factors creating global culture, and you can see them on the right hand side of your screen. Transnational companies, global media, international migration and tourism all play a role in creating a global culture. And also the idea of cultural imperialism we mentioned previously. So the USA, westernization, Americanization are all influences that the USA and Europe have had on the rest of the world, which create this global culture idea. And westernized culture in general has included things like wealth creation, high levels of consumption, privatization of industry, fashion, technology, attitudes towards the physical environment, and the idea that our landscape and our environment should be used and exploited for its natural resources, oil, gas, coal, rubber from deforestation, and so on. All of these ideas are Western ideas. And that is, in a way, how the Western ideal has become so rich and how Western culture has spread around the world, creating a global culture. And we looked at this cultural change through three ways. 
changing diets in Asia, indigenous people of Amazonia, and also the 2016 Rio Paralympic athletes. So starting with changing diets in Asia, what we've seen in Asia is essentially a shift from a traditional Asian diet to high meat consumption. And this has meant that during the 1990s, meat consumption per capita increased from five kilograms to 50 kilograms every year. Fast food chains like McDonald's have moved all around the world and increased. And this has meant more processed goods, more meat being eaten by Asian people. The environment has also been impacted, therefore, by this. A rise in emissions, a rise in agricultural demand, land degradation from more agriculture taking place. So McDonald's is a great example of how meat consumption has risen in Asia. We also had the idea of indigenous tribes in the Amazon. Of course, tribes are becoming increasingly aware of a Western culture and lifestyle because of the media partly too. Increasing urbanization is taking place. More tribe people are moving towards towns and cities. They're wearing more Western style clothing than the traditional clothing. Basically, social needs here in these tribes are triumphing over uh, types of cultures that they're used to. So they're triumphing over cultural values. Education and health are becoming more important to people. So is income. And that essentially means that people are tending to decide to move to cities and towns. We also have the idea then of the 2016 Rio Paralympics. And this is the idea of spreading a culture whereby we accept everybody for their different needs, strengths and who they are. So there is a cultural change in attitude towards disabled people. We see the global media promoting the work of Paralympians in the 2016 Rio Olympics. We've seen the Rio Olympics broadcast worldwide in 160 nations. And we've also seen, that, therefore, the changing attitudes of people in less developed, more traditional societies towards different types of culture and the needs of people. That is an overview of the EQ2 part of the globalization topic. Hopefully that was useful to you. Of course, remember that you can also watch the next video, which is on screen for you, which will be EQ3, looking at the physical environment, how players should respond to the challenges of globalization in general. I hope you found this video useful and see you in the next one.